Hey, it's Samantha Hartley, and this is the Profitable Joyful Consulting Podcast. It's season three, and my theme this season is consultants and consulting. So I'm actually going to have some guests this season to speak with you. And the way that I've selected them is actually really strict criteria. They had to meet three things. The first one is that what they do would be relevant and be something that you could possibly even take into your clients to um, augment your own work. The second thing is that you could learn from them. So like something that they can teach is something that we can learn and use to be better at what we do. And the third thing is that they would share with us how they grow their business. Because I always love to hear what people are doing in their market marketing and what's working for them. So those are the guests you're going to be enjoying with me this season. And today we are kicking off with an amazing one. I met Gary Ware a year ago in Hawaii, where he was facilitating some uh, team building exercises for an organization that I was with. And it was super illuminating how these games that we were playing went and what kind of discoveries came uh, bubbled up uh, just from playing games. In this interview, you're going to hear how he got all of his first clients and also how he has pivoted his business from being all in person to entirely virtual during the pandemic. You'll hear tons of ways that he is using play in his work and also the ways that we can use it in our lives to be better um, business owners and take better care of ourselves, as well as the research and science behind why it works. Gary spent 14 years in a corporate position before leaving to start his own thing. He experienced extreme burnout, which helped him to get reacquainted with play in his life and the the value that it has, and to bring that to his clients. We open this interview with Gary sharing a story about how play and a game that he took into one of his corporate clients helped a leader to make an amazing discovery about herself. So Gary, tell me about a time when you uh, took a game into a corporation, one of your clients, um, and what happened with that. And what I'd love to hear is like what they brought you in for and then what kind of it turned out that they brought you in for. Yeah, uh, I have so many. <laughs> uh, but, for, but to narrow it down on something that's very impactful that there's a really great takeaway. I was working with the San Diego Padres with the sales team. And they brought me in to just do normal team building leadership development. Um, all of these salespeople are like individual entrepreneurs. You know, they, they have a book of business, uh, but at the same time, they have to work well together. So this was a great way to build community. It was a great way for us to learn in a playful environment. And the story that I think the people are people listening can resonate with is that there was this uh, VP, VP of sales, and just on paper, everything was going very well. Um, you know, she was well regarded at the, um, at the company. She had a really great team. And we did this activity that had the intention of the activity was to help people realize that multitasking is not a good thing Um, because most people think they can multitask, but in reality, what you're doing is just brain switching. And so the game was designed to really accent that and give people an experience so that they learn firsthand that they're not as effective as they think so that you can get rid of that overconfidence. And at the end, when we were doing the debrief on the activity, this VP, she had this um, this experience, and she shared a story with us that was very vulnerable, and it allowed us to sort of work on that in real time. So let me tell you about the game first, and then I'll tell you about her um, her experience. So in this activity, we're in a group environment. The person in the middle is the focus, and then everyone gets a chance to be in all the positions. And your main job is to just listen to the person in front of you tell a story. And after 45 seconds, you're going to be quizzed on, you know, how much detail you can retell back. And, you know, if you got at least, you know, minimum of 95% correct, you get a thumbs up. Awesome. Well, there's a catch. There are people on all sides of you that are asking you questions. Someone's going to ask you an addition question. Someone's going to ask you a fill in the blank question, spelling questions. And you have to answer them all while trying to do your main objective. And 
by doing that, every time that you take your attention away from the story to answer a question, you miss part of the story. And it also creates in your body cortisol and adrenaline, which uh, the effects of those are short-term memory loss, rash decisions, you know, stress, anxiety. And so then we're debriefing and most people were talking about how, how wow, well, uh, they didn't realize that, you know, they didn't know as much because they thought, I heard the story. And then when they went back to recall the story, they realized in that moment that they, they just didn't remember. And so then we're talking about the effects of, you know, um, multitasking and how that impacts their business and, and their day-to-day work. And this VP, she, she quietly raises her hand and she's almost in tears. Um, and she talks about, she said, wow, I had a, a different experience. Yes, I realized that multitasking is bad. However, I saw that experience as how I set up my team in that I was the person in the middle and all the people that were asking me questions were my team. And I set that up. I set up an environment where they have to bring everything to me. No wonder I'm so stressed out all the time. And, you know, in that moment, you know, as a, as a collective group, you know, brainstorm, how can we adjust that? And so that was like a very powerful moment where through play, through activity, someone was able to realize, wow, there's a different way of doing things. And because it's a low stakes environment, we can experiment. Well, what else could you do? Um, So I love this story. How do you, um, do you just have a roster of a million games? How do you decide which games are going to help you achieve what purpose when you go into your clients? I, I do have a lot of roster, (laughs) like a lot of games. Uh, Well, my background is in applied improvisation. Uh, so I, as an actual theatrical improviser, you know, I've been performing on stages for the last decade with an ensemble, making things up on the spot. And the games that we have used to help us get in that state where we can do that works very well to teach people how to listen better, how to think quicker on their feet, to be more adaptable. And so I've taken a number of those games and brought them into team and individual situations to help people, you know, learn in a low stakes environment. Also, because the cool thing about play, and I call this purposeful play, where you can play a game and then it has a different meaning. You can play, essentially, this is the cool thing about play. This is the cool thing about our brains is you can play any game. And if it's set up in a certain way, you can think back on that experience and learn so much about how you show up in the world. Well, when we met, uh, it was at uh, an event in Hawaii and you led us through games and I would not have believed what you just said. You know, there are the people who are like, how you do anything is how you do everything. And if somebody cheats at golf, that's probably who they really are as a person. And I always felt like, you know, in different contexts, people are different in different contexts. Mm -hmm. Um, Agree. But uh, I think when there was a game that we all played together and I was still new to the group, but I had kind of some first impressions of people and through the playing of the game, what I really saw was like, wow, this is somebody who doesn't um, give credit to people. And this is somebody who can't stay focused on the task. And, you know, there was a bunch of, I just thought it was a really interesting exercise. Um, And I did feel closer to the group as a whole after we had played this, the the whole segment of games. Uh, So I really liked how it, um, how it brought people together. I mean, it also shows you who, who is like, that's not somebody who's for me. So there are certain people in the group who, who are not that way. Um, so do people tend to bring you in more often for uh, problem solving or, or team building? What do you feel like is um, what you're known for to your clients that they bring you in for? I like to say that the entry level to me is through team building. There's some sort of quarterly event And they want to supplement it with whatever they have on the agenda. So they say, oh, let's do something fun. You know, they probably heard about me from, you know, a colleague or something like that. And then I get brought in for a team building um, experience. The cool thing is the way that they're structured, you can't unsee what you just saw. You can't unexperience what you just experienced. And I like to say that we are all perfect just the way that we are. The challenge is we're put into a situation that will 
essentially bring out the worst in us. And, and that's why I like to say, you know, don't hate the player, hate the game. And a lot of times in these corporate environments, you wonder, like, why are people so cutthroat? Why are people um, stepping on each other's toes? Why are people not listening? And I like to say, no one said, I'm going to get this job and be the most, you know, be the biggest a-hole that I can be. It's just that over time, because of the environment, they sort of develop that personality. And so as a result of the team building experience, you know, at the end, you know, there's a debrief and there's like, all right, well, what do we need to work on? Because I, I can say, yeah, this was a fun event. You're going to have a lot of fun, but it's going to be all for naught if you don't take this moment to break down what are the, what are the things that we need to work on as a group, take stock in that, and then make steps to improve. And that's where I get brought back to companies and I work with individuals because through these games, they start to realize, I love what you mentioned earlier about habits because, you know, maybe when you first started uh, working at a company, you know, you had one intention, but because of the environment, you develop these habits and then they become unconscious. And so now through play, you've exposed those, you have an awareness to them. And now it's just all about creating an environment where you can learn and grow from that. I love that. And so do you then make a a kind of plan together with the companies that bring you back in for transforming those habits or um, working on those behaviors together? Yes and no. Um, I like to say as a facilitator, I'm there to hold space. At the end of the day, through this, you know what you need to work on. So you don't need me to say, you need to work on this. You will decide, oh, you know what? As a result of this, I need to work on this thing. I'm probably not the best collaborator. And then from there, yes, I can be a resource to help with additional training uh, where we can play games and then we can learn from that because this is true fact. To create a new synapse in the brain, it takes about 420 repetitions. Um, A long time. This is the shortcut. If you can infuse it with play, you can decrease that to about 20 repetitions. No, really? Serious. Why have I never because heard that? That's amazing. I know. And, and the people are like, oh, I don't have time for play. Well, you're looking at play through the wrong lens. From zero to about nine, everything that kids learn is through play. When you are playing, your brain is in an alternate reality where you are experimenting. But the cool thing about play and through these uh, facilitated experiences, you're it's, I call it a peak emotional experience, PEE for short. And you are, um, you're doing something, you're having a lot of joy, you're having a lot, like all these emotions, you're with your, you know, your comrades, and your brain is in this peak state. And when you're in a peak state, your brain is heightened, and it's taking stock of everything that is happening. And you're going to be more likely to retain that information considering, you know, compared to the opposite of like, all right, do it again. All right, do it again. And it's not plays more of just like going through the motions. Uh, That I really understand. That takes me to the way that I see this in um, my my work and my clients and my clients are the consultants who also serve those companies like you go into. Uh, One of them said to me, um, I, I haven't been able to do that because it feels like work. And I really identified with that because one of the things that I've struggled with recently is a a heinous task that I needed to make happen, a a project. And um, I just did not want to do it. And I was fighting and fighting and fighting with myself. And there was a part of me that was like, here's a playful way to do it. And I was like, shut up, we're busy. So when when I finally relented and said, all right, what's your brilliant idea? And I did it that way. It got me out of this amazing trench and moving forward. So in both cases, I think when we regard things as like feeling like work, um, it makes them hard to do, but we, we are working. And so what's the way that uh, we as small business owners or uh, one person businesses, or if I have a small consultancy where there's a few people who also work uh, with me and for me, um, how can we bring this sensibility in? Yeah, a few things. First and foremost, um, a wise woman once said, for every job that must be done, um, you add an element of fun and snap, the job's a game. That was Mary Poppins, in case you didn't know. (laughs) And you're absolutely right. 
when you can see the work as play, you will do it for the sake of doing it. Because think about any game that you have ever played. The joy is in the game. And yes, I, sometimes with sports and, and gambling stuff, stuff like that, like I feel like the emphasis becomes on winning. And in that case, in my opinion, that's not true play. Something else takes over. Mm -hmm. And there's an amazing book called, uh, it's called um, Prime to Perform. Uh, the Science of Total Motivation. Amazing book. Highly recommend it. Um, it talks about creating cultures where you can do your best work. And this, this um, you know, they have a score called TOMO, Total Motivation. And in that book, they look at what are the three intrinsic motivators and then the three uh, external motivators and how it, in, how it leads you to doing your best work. And so if you the three intrinsic is play, as in you can see the work as play, and it may require some creativity, but you mm -hmm. can see the work as solving creative problems, and the actual doing the work is um, thrilling for you, brings a lot of joy. The other one is potential. You see the potential um, of um, of what you do. Like, all right, it's going to help me grow. It's going to help me... Uh, do all these other things. And then the other one is purpose. The impact of the work is what drives you. And again, it requires some reframing um, of the work because most people focus on the external. So emotional pressure. Mm -hmm. So if I don't do a good job, I'm going to be shamed or I'm going to be disappointed in myself if I don't achieve certain things or economic pressure. And, you know, I need to make money for, you know, living to help my family, or there is some sort of bonus structure if I can hit so many marks. And then the last one, which is the worst, is inertia, where you're like, I'm just here because I'm here. I've been doing it. And studies show that those three externals over time will decrease performance because what it does, it takes away your drive to do what is called adapt performance so tactical performance is just your ability to do the job just the nuts and bolts but if that's all we needed <laughs> blockbuster probably would still be in business let's just be honest <laughs> if we just need tactical performance kodak would yep. still be the leader we yep. need adaptive performance as well and that is your ability to be agile that is your ability to be creative and if you're just focusing on those external things, it actually takes away your ability to do creative thinking. Because if you have too much emotional pressure or um, economic pressure, then you're not going to take risk. You're not going to do the thing that may lead, you know, in um, a potential failure. But we need those things. And that's where play comes into. Because the cool thing is, think about it any time that you've been playing whether it's a sports game or a video game or, you know, shoots and ladders. Sometimes you have to take a risk, but in the play state, that's encouraged. In the play state, that is seen as a fun challenge. That is what's necessary. Why can't we take that same mindset and bring it to business? So what's, what, I mean, I've heard of, obviously, of people being motivated by purpose and people being motivated by potential in, uh, as the kinds of businesses that we are. What I haven't heard about is people being motivated by play. I, I talk about this in, a lot of times in terms of joy. Like, we do, you should be in a joy state all the time in your business. Yes. And my reason for that is because if I wanted to be non-joyful, I would have stayed at my corporate job. So, <laughs> listen, we chose this. <laughs> we chose this. Uh, we're doing this. Let's be joyful doing it instead of miserable. <laughs> Uh, and if you're miserable, it's a sign you need to get something needs to change. So what I had never Agreed. heard anyone say though was like, well, you should. Where's the play? Now, if I think about it, there are many things that we're doing. I mean, I I would say what we're doing right now is playing, even though it's like feels smart. But um, yes. you know, I wanted you on here because I was like, I want to be in Gary's energy because in his energy feels great, and I love that it's um, that you're able to offer the. Um, the 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 science behind it the reasons why behind it reasons why this stuff works but so so what are ways like how do you play in your work um running a business and and doing the business it's not just when you're with your clients 
Because I've no. seen you and you don't look like you're playing. You look like you're um, holding boundaries, uh, keeping people safe. Like you're, you're really amazing to watch lead exercises and also debrief the exercises because you're in charge and, and there's a different part of you than when you're presenting and you're like a fun guy. The guy who runs those exercises is a different version of yourself. So where does that play come in? That's all play. And so this is, it needs to start by changing the definition of play. Uh, okay. Because a lot of times we see play as very juvenile, um, which I, I love that version uh, as well. Um, but play, so one of the cool things about play and defining work as play is um, like you feel that the work itself is the reason why you're there. And for me, I enjoy the work. I enjoy being uh, there to hold space for people and seeing that transformation take place. Um, I do bring a bit of levity when necessary. I sprinkle it in. You know, it's you know, it's just like um, a seasoning. If you add too much, it's gonna it's gonna ruin the dish. Uh, but for me, I see work as play, as in, oh, I'm overcoming challenges, as you said earlier, an adventure. I look at it through that lens. And I like to say there's a difference between being childlike and then childish. Mm -hmm. Childlike, you bring that sense of curiosity. You bring that sense of wonder. You bring that sense of joy. Um, you're trying to overcome challenges. Childish is the stuff we want to avoid. <laughs> you know, uh, being spoiled, um, you know, not sharing, like all of those things. And so that is how I look at the the world now. So for me, because that work is so much of a thrill for me, I leave feeling energized. Um, I love it and I want to do more of it. For me, I also, and that's, to be honest, that's a small percentage of the overall work. I wish I was on stages every single day or in community every single day doing this work. It's not a reality. And so for the people that are running their own business, this is where you really have to get creative is how can you look at the other aspects of the work as play mm -hmm. the i'm i need to build my business my book of business by doing outreach you know i have to <laughs> have to do invoices and stuff like that and maybe <laughs> it's just like you like look this is outside of my uh zone of genius i should probably outsource that yeah. and and that would be a great investment for you because then you can save that energy for something else but if you say you can't, you know, say right now is just not a feasible thing. All right. Well, how can you bring, how can you bring the spirit of play into the work? And that might mean that here, you know, by me sitting down for 35 minutes and, and doing invoices or all these other things, which I don't really like to do. Um, it allows me to, um, you know, collect revenue, which will allow me to put more back into the business. Now we're getting into mindset. And then also, what if you made it more fun? And like, why does it have to be like, like you said, a joy state? How can you put yourself in a joy state to do the boring stuff? Um, and I know there's resistance, but what if we asked our younger version of ourselves that, you know, the child version of ourselves really have the answer? Well, how would they do it? Right. I love it. So things that come to mind for me are like putting it on a timer and seeing how fast I can do it. Um, and also uh, putting, um, putting a fun uh, uh, logo or sticker or message on each of the invoices, because that would make them feel less like boring money and more like sending a message to someone I love who was my client. You know, one of the ways that I make a lot of heinous tasks fun is that I do them with my team because then they're uh, collaborative and, and that's, just immediately more fun for me. And uh, it, was, it was really good for me to discover that years ago that I wanna be, for a lot of people they can't get the work done in their business that's for them, we always get client work done, right? Because hey, <laughs> but it's hard for us to get yeah. our work done. And when I realized, oh, I need to be accountable to somebody, um, and how about I'll be accountable to my team? So my team is constantly hounding me for things that are due, but, that, but I love that because, um, they make the work funner. I want to, I want to think about like, this is the thing that I owe to them and stuff. So during your day, when you need, when you need breaks, what are some kind of play breaks that you, you take? Yes. So that's, I'm so glad that you brought that up because that's the other thing that 
busy professionals, busy entrepreneurs need to realize. A lot of times I, you know, you, you get the POV of, well, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. That's nice. Um, Or, you know, we need to hustle, hustle, hustle. I'm, I'm with you. You know, the, the work's not going to do itself. Um, And if you want to make an impact in the world, you need to need to work a lot, but I'm all about working smarter, not harder. I'm all about being intelligent. And the science shows that the longer that you work uh, without breaks, the, you know, the more likely you're going to make mistakes. Um, you know, I, I heard this, this phrase that when you rest, or actually reverse that, you should work from a place of rest instead of trying to work so that you can rest. Okay, that's a good one. So does it say that again yeah. for us? You should work from a place of rest instead of working so that you can rest. So because it it's, it's work, like, what does it mean I mean, to work from a place of rest? It means you need to fill up your, your container so that you have something to, to pour from it. And you need to be mindful of when that container is getting empty. And if you are a person that wants to make an impact in the world, why would you give someone your gift that's not 100%? And so how I look at this is um, I start to categorize the activities that I do of either filling me with energy or reducing my energy. And if I'm doing something that is reducing my energy for a long period of time, um, I need to take a break and I need to rejuvenate. That is, is clear and simple. That way I can be at my best. And as a result, I can probably get things done faster with more accurate, uh, accuracy than if I'm just like, oh, I just need to power through. Right. Now, don't right, get me right. wrong. There's going to be the person that's listening that's like, you don't get it, Gary. It's urgent. You know, I got to get this done. You're right. That should not be the, the norm. That should yeah. be the exception. Um, and what I do is I have moments and I need, this is the thing, I can't even trust my own self. So I need to have interventions uh, because I, I tend to be my amount of energy and I swear I have more energy than I, than I really have. And so I set up situations like what you said, look, I'm only going to work um, on this uh, for about 90 minutes and then I'm going to give myself 20 minutes of uh, rejuvenation. And then I'm going to do a five minute setup and then I'm going to jump back in again. That's like my sort of cycle. Mm-hmm. And during that 25 minutes, um, I have what is called a playlist. And these are the things that bring me joy. These are the things that spark my energy. And studies show that when you do that, you will be able to actually perform longer, harder, better, faster than um, the person that powers through. I love that. And I, I feel like I want to assign to everyone right now listening to write down your top five uh, rejuvenators, because what comes to me immediately, like, you know, my animals give me joy. So if I just go and look at them, then I, I immediately get an endorphin rush or um, and then uh, yeah. like there are birds right outside my window. I go outside in all kinds of weather because that helps me um, you know, kind of elevate. And then also I might kind of text with somebody. So I'm connecting with people. So those are uh, the things that, uh, you know, um, rejuvenate me. And that's usually what I do on my little five minute breaks. Uh, I try to go towards my husband away from snacks in terms of, you know, the, the, the choices that I make when I have a break. So those are mine. What are some of yours? Yeah. And see, that is play. That again is play. Um, And for me, um, I have a three-year-old son. So I, I step out of the office and, and, and I catch his attention and, and he's like, like uh, on me. Uh, Always like, on. Right. He's like, <laughs> ready to dada, go. Dada. And yeah. Right. And then he's like, Hey, how about we do this? How about we, how about we do that? Um, also, one of the things that I love to do, and this is something that is unique to everyone. And I invite you listening to take inventory of this is when you were younger, things were simpler. What did you do for play? Um, and you know, and when I say play is like not just sports, but what, what did you do for leisure? What did you do for enjoyment? And the challenge is how can you incorporate that in a short period of time? Uh, so for me, I loved uh, building Legos when I was a kid. 
Um, so I um, actually, my son stole most of them, so I don't have any within an arm's reach. Currently, <laughs> the act of doing it is joy, and it's not about what I build. It's just like, oh, wow. And then I look at some stuff, I'm like, oh, this is really rad. You know, look what I created. Mm -hmm. um, but that is like the icing on the cake is that it, I'm not doing it for that. I'm doing it for, um, you know, that uh, piece of nostalgia. Another thing, when I grew up, I really liked video games. Um, you know, those sort of retro, it's funny saying that ret it's retro now, but it was like Super Nintendo, PlayStation, stuff like that. And what I have, I have this uh, on my computer, I have this emulator where I can play those old school games. And so if I need a little bit of a nostalgia, I'll go and for like 25 minutes, I'll go play you know, one of the games I love playing as a kid. And again, it's not to beat it. It's just to have that moment to just take my brain off of what I was working on. And pro tip, uh, if you really want to jump back into the work and um, hit the ground running, uh, you need to give yourself a cliffhanger. Most people, the reason why they don't want to stop is they like, oh, I need to get to this end. Well, guess what? Your brain is still working on it, even though you're not consciously working on it. So just if you think about a show that you love to watch, when we had shows that came on weekly instead of been watching every episode, when it ended, you couldn't help but to continue to think about it for that whole week. That's how our brains work. Our brains want to finish things. They want to, in that, in that uh, sort of ellipse. So if you can pause whatever you're working on, especially if you're trying to be creative, then go off and do something that allows you to rejuvenate, allows you to take your brain off. Maybe you're doing something you know, uh, that is physical or something like that. When you jump back in, because your brain is still working on it, you're going to jump back in and probably have this spurt of inspiration. Um, and, then, and then you're not going to like, uh, you're not going to have any setbacks. I love it. I love that idea. So you leave the work with an open loop that it works on while you're do doing a play or rest or whatever you're doing. And then when you come back, you can work on closing the loop more expeditiously than you would have without the, the, the play. Yes. Rest. So that's amazing. That's, I, exactly. I love that idea and did not know that. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So um, you like, I and our listeners are a consultant and you work with some amazing blue chip companies. And I wondered how you, um, who were some of your first clients when you started doing this and then how you got a foot into these uh, really, really amazing um, corporations that you go in and work with. Just a quick primer on how I got to where I am. I never thought that I would be where I am now because it was never my intention to run a facilitation company, even though now when I think back, I'm like, yeah, I am where I need to be. And this is amazing. So after the last business that I was in, I was in with a business partner. Um, we broke up. Uh, I was at a crossroad and I was thinking, well, what's next? So this facilitation stuff that I did, I had done on the side. I had done for fun. I had done for free. It was how I grew my team. So it was something that I enjoyed. Um, and then I was thinking, maybe there's something uh, to this. And uh, most of the credit, uh, if I'm honest, like 99% of the credit goes to my wife for inspiring me to like pursue this Good. Um, even further. So listen to, listen to your partners out there. They know you better than you know yourself. So that's lesson number one. Uh, but number two is, well, how do I get clients? And I learned from a mentor of mine, people buy from people that they know, like, and trust at the end of the day. So I would rather consider myself a person of influence than a salesperson. You know, I don't want to like say, Hey, you need to buy my thing. I don't even know you, but do it anyway. I was all about, well, I know that this, like, and I'm just being honest. I was like, most people, they were like, think this is kind of weird. Why should I invest some, you know, pretty, um, you know, pretty hefty dollars into something that I don't really know much about. It seems kind of weird. I So what I did was I reached out to my network and because I knew I had something, but I knew it was, if you tried it, you will be hooked and you will want more. So I was like, I'm going to be the drug dealer for play. <laughs> and so I love it. that was, that was my thing. And again, it made it very playful, not because I'm like, oh, I'm going to be a drug dealer, but it was more of, 
how can I do the things that I like to do? I like to connect people. Um, I'm very social. So I reached out to people that I knew and I said, hey, look, this is what I have going on. Um, I am starting a new endeavor. I, you may not have, you know, done improv or any sort of play like this, uh, but I know that you're probably looking for, you know, some enrichment for your team. So I offered what I called a complimentary recess. I said for 45 minutes, I'll come and I, on me, my gift to you, um, you know, I'll, I'll deliver this. I love to get feedback. If there's stuff you'd like, let me know. If there's stuff that didn't sit well, let me know because I'm, I'm refining this. Uh, all I ask is that if it was something of value, you, um, if you see an opportunity for us to work together, let me know. Um, I'd love to like be considered. Or if someone that you know uh, could benefit from this, would you mind making an introduction? And again, I made it a win-win because uh, in the world of improv where I come from, we have these principles that allow us to create magic on stage. And one of them is how can you make your partner look amazing? So the last thing I want is to like pressure someone. I know it works, but I don't want someone to come from a place of pressure to make a decision. Um, you know, there, there's a time and place for that. Uh, but for this, you know, I want them to be curious. I want them to come from that playful state. And, and so that's what I did. I, I, and for me, then it was more like play instead of, all right, Gary, you got to get 10 more sales calls in, you know? So I came, I looked at it as, oh, I'm just connected with people. All right. You know, and then it became like fun. It became a game. And then people said, yes, some people said no, but a number of people said yes. And then I got so many amazing testimonials. And then someone said, oh, you got to go talk to such and such. And so then, I, so then it became a warm introduction, and then that led me to speaking on a few stages where I was able to do my complimentary recess instead of like a group of 10, I did for a group of 300, and those people said, oh, well, let me bring you into my company. And so that, again, you know, is how it happened, but the, the main lesson here is I took something that seemed like a dreadful thing, like making sales calls. And I made it to fun. It was like, well, if if we were kids, what would kids do? Oh, kids like, hey, do you want to come out and play? Hey, do you want to do this? Like, it, that's how I looked at it. I just love it. It's so beautiful. I love, I mean, I hadn't heard the word recess probably in 10 years. So I, I just love that idea. And I feel like uh, who wouldn't want that? So it's, you know, uh, we would call that free sampling. It's a free sampling strategy. It's the same thing that the Coca-Cola company uses to get new um, consumers. You just go and you like, <laughs> You want to, want to try it, you hand it to them and they try it. And then you have either somebody who's a consumer or somebody who says, I don't want it, but that is, uh, that's the way that they grew that. And I think it's, uh, it's a fabulous strategy and it's, you know, you have to be brave and take risks and all that stuff. But it, it uh, I, what I like is that you found something that was um, palatable for you and doable for you. And as you said, is totally win-win for the people who brought you in. So I super love that. And I know that what you do is experiential. And so probably your business is one of the ones that had to pivot our uh, new favorite word for 2020 when COVID hit. So can you, can you share with us what basically how that hit you and then what you've, you've done to adapt? Yeah. I feel like I've been, <laughs> you know, pivoting is like, is like the new norm for me because in the beginning I thought the answer, like when I first started doing this, I thought the answer was improvisation. Turns out that most people are scared of improv. Who would have known? So then I was like, all right, well, what's your, like, you know, what are you looking for? Um, oh, training. All right, cool. That's what I do. I do training. I'm, <laughs> I'm a trainer. Uh, and especially around play, like, oh, we don't have time for play. Don't worry. This is enrichment. Like, obviously, <laughs> this is wellness, you know? And so again, I'm all about adapting, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to like learn um, you know, the core, my core offering stays, stays the same, but it's all about listening and well, what are you looking for and how can I make that alignment? And so COVID hit, um, like, I guess everyone's the same thing. You know, when you kicked off 2020, no one in their wildest dreams thought that, uh, they would be dealing with a global pandemic. I thought, you know, this was going to be the year mm -hmm. that I got into as many companies as, as possible. But the cool thing Oh, oh, and on top of that, I liked how um, I had the intention for the year of experimentation, 
consistency, and joy. Those are my three code words for 2020. And when COVID hit, I did have a moment of mourning of like, oh, what am I going to do? You know, followed by, holy crap, <laughs> like what's going on? Because my business went from uh, about to be on, you know, a few dozen stages and in front of, you know, um, a few dozen companies to nothing, uh, to crickets. Uh, and so one of the cool things I, again, followed my own advice. I took some time to reflect and I was just building Legos and, you know, I said, you know what, uh, in, in, in improv, you know, we like to say, what is the diamond in the garbage? And I said, well, I did say I wanted to be in, as many companies as possible. Well, I can't go anywhere, but I can because there's this thing called the internet. And so I immediately, you know, jumped into the sandbox. Uh, I think I went a little bit too much. I'll talk about that in a moment. But I said, you know what? I have more time. I have a lot more time than I than I thought. Uh, now, um, I would love to do some collaborations. Like I want to see how this is going to work in a virtual environment. Um, so who wants to collaborate? And so I started doing weekly uh, improv, um, uh, complimentary improv workshops on Zoom. Again, doing what I did in the very beginning. I was like, hey, look, we're doing this on Zoom. Who wants to come and try it out? Give me some feedback. Um, and as a result, uh, that's how I connected with our mutual contact, Heather Willems, because someone said, hey, you need to meet Heather. She's doing some really cool stuff with graphic facilitation. You two might be able to do something pretty rad. And then that's how we created an amazing, very powerful workshop on playing with fear. Wow. And so um, that is what I spent my, it seems like my like April, May, and June uh, doing. And then I ended up uh, burning myself out uh, because, um, again, like I said earlier, uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes I don't know what, what too much is. And so then uh, um, I like had to like sort of time out, slam on the brakes. Um, but in that moment, I had something pretty amazing. I, I road tested dozens and dozens of games in a virtual environment. And I found that some games, some experiences were even better in a virtual environment than in person. And so that now I had even more confident, um, like when companies were realizing, well, we're going to be here a lot longer. We need to get things going again. We need right. this enrichment. We need this, you know, personal development. I felt very confident with my ability to deliver a world-class experience that is going to um, help people with that transformation. That is super, super smart. I've heard a couple of people say that they, that they adapted, they practiced, they came in, they did the events, um, they, they experimented with different things, and then they also have arrived at, at, at events that they feel like are better. Well, they don't feel like they're um, the respondents, the participants are saying, this is better than when we were doing this live. So I think that's amazing. And I'm not surprised. I'm a big, like, I would prefer almost, almost everything was virtual. Uh, so uh, um, I, I think that's uh, super important. What I want to hear about is what's what was your um, re recovery transition from uh, exhaustion to kind of like back on track again? Yeah. And so I, first and foremost, I had to be aware. <laughs> I had to have an awareness like, oh, this, what I'm feeling is, is burnout. And, and I've read so much stuff recently about uh, you have a thing called surge energy yeah. when like things happen, like you go into like crisis mode and then that like takes a lot of your stuff. Uh, but if you're not careful, um, you know, you can reach that like level of burnout. And then also there was another one, uh, the name is escaping me, but it's basically like if you're a person that is uh, providing services for others, um, you know, because you're in that and other people's energy, you know, will drain you faster, you'll find that burnout will come out of nowhere. And that's essentially mm -hmm. what happened to me. And so once I had that awareness, I needed to be true to myself. And so again, um, I know common sense is not always common practice. Uh, but I went back, um, back to basics, um, you know, prioritize rest, uh, made sure that I was getting um, more rest than I was getting before. And also um, my three-year-old son, you know, started sleeping even more through the night. So that, that, uh, that, <laughs> that made um, things a lot better, but, you know, also boundaries. And there's something that my wife and I did that I was talking to a behavior specialist and they're like, oh my gosh, that was so smart. Like, again, we were just like, in desperation mode because our son would get up super early and we wouldn't have like that sort of time to sort of like 
ease into the day. And so we got him this clock and, and we said, um, when it turns green, that means you can come out of your room. Um, until then, if you wake up and it's not green, um, you just have to just hang out in your room. You can play, you can do whatever you want, but you just have to stay in your room. And so again, that created space, um, you know, for me to get some meditation in. Um, I, again, wasn't able to go to the gym, but I, um, you know, still did some stretches, you know, tried to get some yoga in. I started running on uh, jogging, um, at least until the fires and, and air quality was kind of bad. But those are the things that, again, start that rejuvenation process. Um, and it's, you have to, this is the thing, if you don't have the right intention for it, if you don't have the right purpose for it, you're not going to see it as a rejuvenating uh, feature. If your definition of that is like, oh, that's something that weak people do. Well, you're not going to get the benefits from it because you're going to feel like you're coerced into that and your your body's not going to reap all the benefits of someone with an open mind that realizes like, no, this is a necessity. Thank you so much for sharing that, Gary, because I feel like that's a situation that a lot of people find themselves in. I think it's hard for them to be aware of it. And then it's hard for them to, to do the things that you did and your, um, your clock tip is gold. So um, one of the things that uh, we have talked about, you know, they had these experiments with mice where if mice don't play, they die. Um, I tried to Google that and I got a, a thing about um, uh, computer mice and gamers who also I think die if they play too much. <laughs> so why, why, why are, are play and creativity uh, essential for us as human beings? The study that you're referencing is that they had mice um, and some mice, they um, took the play away from them. And then the others, they, they allowed them to, um, to play. And the mice that was uh, sort of starved of play, what ended up happening was their brain didn't fully develop like the other mice. And when they were put into situations where they needed to be clever, where they needed to outsmart like cats and stuff like that, they weren't able to do it. They were stressed more often than not. Uh, they, you know, they were in this constant state of anxiety because they didn't see any other possibilities uh, because they didn't have, they didn't grow the ability to uh, be adaptive. And so the mice that played, um, they were more adaptive. Uh, they, when they looked into situations that were uncertain, uh, complex, and maybe ambiguous, they saw that as an opportunity to learn and to grow. And, you know, we're very similar to, to you know, mice in that regard, is that, and there's an amazing book called Super Better by researcher Jane McGonigal. And she talks about the, the, growth benefits of using play, um, you know, as that, as that medium. And so she says, first and foremost, you need to go in with, you know, the right purpose. If you see play, like I said earlier, as something to rejuvenate, you're going to use it to its full benefits. But if you see play as an escape, as in, mm -hmm. ah, I can't deal with this right now. So I'm just going to escape by playing because mm -hmm. I don't want to deal with it. Then that's going to be your pattern. Every time something scary comes up, you're going to play and not deal with it. Play is just one sort of um, medium. You know, some people use it with, with eating. Some people use it with exercise. You know, again, it's all about your intention and your purpose, mm -hmm. and your body's going to respond accordingly. And the cool thing about play, as I mentioned, is when you play, um, your brain is connecting the dots. Your brain is doing so many things. When you're playing with groups, um, if we had EKG machines on our heads, um, it would reveal that our brain waves are in sync. And if our brain waves are in sync, we are starting to um, produce oxytocin and serotonin. Those are the um, neurochemicals that help us feel um, like we belong, help us trust other people. So I don't know about you, but that seems like something that is a necessity. Would you agree? Definitely. And I love how it, uh, so it leads them to be more uh, adaptive, ad uh, adaptable to their environment, resilient. I mean, so what I love about the mice example is if you think about yourself, you said like, oh, we learn through play from zero to nine. So, so much stuff you learn about winning, losing. You don't always learn the right lessons when you're a child, but uh, winning, losing, um, here's a different way. Here's a, uh, here's some place I can go hide where they won't find me. Here's a, you know what I mean? It, it, and it just makes you so much more creative. So I wanted you to talk a little bit more about creativity because I think a lot of people feel like they're either creative or they're not creative and that it's like, 
it's a, that kind of a switch rather than a skill that you can develop. Um, and I mentioned to you before that I feel like my, my creativity, especially in improv, which I did used to play in, um, has, has like regressed and I got like stupid in my, in my improv and, I, and that made me feel like, oh, I used to have this uh, access to this thing that isn't there anymore. So uh, can people become more creative? Answer is yes. Uh, just like anything, uh, creativity is a muscle. It's a skill that we can develop. And yes, uh, just like a lot of other skills, there's some people that are a little bit more innately talented, uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't improve. Um, you know, there's, uh, so to prove that point, there was a study done by NASA where they followed a cohort from age five, so kindergarten, uh, all the way to 18, so the end of um, high school. And they found that uh, the kindergartners, 95% of them had genius levels of creativity. And then it started to de decline around 13. And then by the time they were 18, that same cohort, only 3% had genius levels of creativity. And there's a lot of factors that goes into play, like judgment, you know, X, Y, and Z. But like the story that you tell yourself is very powerful. If you tell yourself you're not creative, you're going to believe it. And so for those of you who maybe are in that that, that stage of like, oh, I don't think I'm creative. First and foremost, creativity is a skill. Creativity, all creativity is, is solving problems. That's it. Um, some a number of people equate creativity with artistic ability, and that's one form of creativity. But, um, you know, if you're a parent, uh, you probably had to get very creative. Um, I know, uh, you know, my wife and I, we have as well, like we had a problem the fact that our son is not giving us the space so that we can sort of ease into the day. We got creative. We tried a whole bunch of different things. And you know what? That clock uh, thing happened to be the solution. If that didn't work, we would try something else. Um, and how you can get better at creative, that's where play is important. Because when you're playing, it's a low stakes environment. But as you mentioned earlier, yes, how you do some things is how you do a lot of things. And if you're playing in a low stakes environment, practicing being creative, um, then when it's important, when the stakes are higher, you're going to be more likely to come up with creative solutions. And so one way, and I got this book from an amazing book by an author by the name of James Altucher, and it's called Choose Yourself, an amazing book. And part of his morning practice is every day giving yourself a prompt and timing yourself and coming up with um, 10 or more ideas on that prompt. And it can start as simple as, you know, what are 10 places to go on vacation and then it can get even more complex to what are 10 ways that we can um rid the world uh of infectious diseases again it's not about being right it's all about challenging yourself to to think uh, so that's one way that you can do and again it's just training the brain to be creative uh because a lot of the reasons why we are we don't think as fast on our toes is that we are judging ourselves um I like to say there's the clown and then there's the editor. The, uh, and they need to coexist, but they can't be in the same space at the same time. Mm -hmm. So when you need to come up with ideas, you need the clown to be there. You need, you need all the silly ideas as wacky as it is. You need them all. And then the editor can come out and refine. But if you're trying to edit yourself while you're trying to be creative, they're, they're not, it's not going to work. Totally. I think a lot of us who have, uh, uh, when you're composing and you're editing at the same time, you know that that's very ungratifying. Well, I love, love those ideas. Can you, can you share with us? So if our listeners wanted to kind of take one of your creativity classes or do one of your webinars, uh, what, what is available for us as consultants rather than kind of like your clients who are, are, are larger, larger companies? So first that, yeah. and then um, if somebody wanted to bring you in to one of their clients, let us know about that as well. Uh, currently, um, as of the time of this recording, um, the last Tuesday, Wednesday of the month, uh, I have some open offerings, uh, that's available to the public, um, on Tuesdays, uh, it's, um, I co-facilitate laughter yoga, um, and it's not, uh, doing downward dog and laughing, it's doing silly, um, simulated laughter activities and yoga breathing, um, and that is a lot of fun, uh, I believe it's at 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific. Uh, three to four uh, Pacific the last Tuesday of the month and last Wednesday of the month, same time um, is uh, my improv playground uh, where we do improv activities in a virtual environment um, It's open to the public uh, on my website. Breakthroughplay.com is where you can 
find the schedule for that um, in case things do change. And also that's where if you are a consultant and you, after hearing this, you hear about, uh, you know, you have a client that might want to um, use some sort of experiential methods um, for team development or team building, um, reach out. I, I love doing collaborations uh, with people. And again, my job is to make my clients look amazing. So, you know, how can how can we collaborate so that we can make your clients look amazing? Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And anything else that you'd want to share with our listeners? We said a lot. Uh, you know, if, if I could just sum it up, um, experiment, try something. You know, was there one thing that you heard that made you curious? What if you commit to just playing around with that for a week? No, you know, low stakes. Love it. So I'm going to commit to the, um, the prompts because I love that idea. And I have felt myself not having access to my 10. Um, and I'm going to crash one of your improv classes and bring my husband because we both have a, a background in improv. And I would love to keep um, playing together uh, yeah. with him and with you. I think it would be super, super fun. So I invite anyone listening to this to join us there in a, a brave space held by Gary for us. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so, so much uh, for everything you've shared today, Gary. My pleasure. And if I could just take a moment and acknowledge you. Um, thank you so much for, for holding this space where, um, you know, we can have conversations like this to, to help as many people uh, as possible because it's so needed right now. It's a wrap. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell to get video updates. Thanks.